The Middle East is rapidly changing. You know, there are prophets that say the world will come to an end in the Middle East. You know that, right? All it takes is one person to launch a nuke, and the world changes forever. And I've never felt like that was a possibility in my lifetime until now. Welcome to the Watchman Channel. This channel is all about world news and Bible prophecy, pointing to the soon return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I am asking that if you can, to please help to financially support this ministry. If you feel led to pledge any amount of money, it would be extremely helpful and greatly appreciated. There is a PayPal link in the description box and in my pinned comment below. You can also donate using Cash App. My cash tag is $Watchman1963. Thank you all so much for your prayers and support. God bless. Israel completes its long-anticipated high-stakes retaliatory strikes in Iran. The Israeli military said it conducted precise airstrikes on a number of military targets, including infrastructure across the country. This in response to Iran's missile attack earlier this month. The Iranian army says at least two soldiers were killed in the pre-dawn strikes. Tense night last night. For the second time in six months, Israel has retaliated against Iran, two of the most powerful militaries here in the Middle East, in what it says were several waves of attacks. We started getting the first reports of explosions in Tehran at about 2 a.m. local time. Those kept going until just before sunrise. Flashes over Tehran as Iran's missile defense systems reacted to Israel's strikes, said Iranian state television. Incoming projectiles targeted military bases, it said, in the capital and two western provinces bordering Iraq. Right now, the Israel Defense Forces is conducting precise strikes on military targets in Iran. Israel's military confirmed the attack as Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and defense officials monitored from under the IDF's headquarters in Tel Aviv. The IDF said targets included surface-to-air missile arrays and missile manufacturing facilities. Nuclear and oil facilities were apparently not hit, a demand from Washington in the hopes of avoiding further escalation. The IDF said it conducted several barrages over three hours, done before dawn, in response to Iran's direct attack on Israel on October 1st, when it launched nearly 200 ballistic missiles. That was in retaliation for the assassinations of the leaders of Hamas and Hezbollah, which Iran has funded for decades. This morning in Tehran, residents woke to a seemingly calm city, but some more nervous than others. Uh, Unfortunately, now that war has erupted in the Middle East, we're afraid it will affect us too, said this man. War is frightening, said this woman, but I don't believe a terrible war will happen in Iran. With initial reports of limited damage, the hope is that Iran will not respond ending this round of fighting and avoiding a wider regional war. And now it is Israel's turn to wait again for a possible Iranian retaliation. Washington has warned Iran not to strike back, that if it does, it would hurt attempts to end these back and forth attacks that could then blow up into a wider war. Iran's foreign ministry says Iran is entitled and obliged to defend itself. What the world doesn't understand is that this is a spiritual war fought in the physical realm. Ephesians. 612. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan hates the Jews with a passion. He hates them because God provided both the Bible and the Messiah through them. He hates them because God called them to be his chosen people. He hates them because God has promised to save a remnant of them. He hates them because God loves them. Satan works overtime to plant seeds of hatred in people's hearts toward the Jews. He is determined to destroy every Jew on planet Earth so that God cannot keep his promise to save a great remnant. He tried to annihilate them in the Holocaust. He failed. He will try to destroy them once again during the last half of the tribulation. He will fail again. All right, just giving you the uh, latest on that uh, Israel attack on Iran. It was the largest such attack on Israel's part in history ever. I've never seen anything like it. The ten Iranian guards, we are told, have died in this attack. Danny Danan with us right now, the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. Uh, ambassador, always good having you. So there will be a response to your response. And, and on we go. What do you think? Well, Neil, I, I told you when we spoke a few weeks ago that uh, what happened on October 1st 
uh, we will not sit idly by. We will retaliate. That's exactly what we did last night. We sent a very clear message to Iran that you cannot send 200 ballistic missiles into Israel and expect us to, not to react. But unlike the Iranians, you know, they targeted civilians. They used the ballistic missiles, to say the least, which are not accurate. We used the highly precise uh, weapons and we targeted the military facilities. And it was a very successful uh, operation. Just look at the map, see the distance between Israel and Iran, and think about the capability that we have today to reach everywhere in, in Iran. I think today they know that they are vulnerable and we would advise them not to challenge us. Let's bring in General Anthony Tata, U.S. Army Brigadier General. What's your take on the scope of these attacks by Israel and what they mean about where this goes? The first thing I'd like to say, uh, with President Trump, we had maximum pressure in the Abraham Accords, and now with Harris and Biden, uh, we have maximum chaos. And and what you've had for the last three years is this just uh, full pe metal to the uh, pedal to the metal uh, against Israel from all these Shia militia groups in Iran. And now Iran has struck back in a very precise way military targets. And I, I don't know if they made a trade with the United States or if they were pressured by the United States not to go after the oil infrastructure and the nuclear infrastructure. Perhaps that's the next round of attacks if Iran uh, escalates. But, uh, uh, you know, what we've got right now is Israel demonstrating that the F-35s and its capabilities can defeat the S-400 uh, Russian uh, air defense systems that uh, uh, Russia provided to Iran. It's a serious situation, and and the whole the whole re region is on fire right now because of the Harris Biden incompetence. As we continue to watch the Muslim world unite against Israel, the Bible tells us there are four possible prophecies on the verge of finding fulfillment. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14, the burden against Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. Then behold, at eventide, trouble, and before the morning he is no more. This is the portion of those who plunder us, and the lot of those who rob us. Isaiah 17, 9, in that day his strong cities will be as a forsaken bow, and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. Isaiah 17, 1 and 14 tell us Damascus will be destroyed in a single night. Verse 9 suggests it is the children of Israel who caused this desolation, possibly with a nuclear weapon. Jeremiah 49, 34 through 37. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. In the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will break the bow of Elam, the foremost of their might. Against Elam I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven and scatter them toward all those winds. There shall be no nations where the outcasts of Elam will not go. For I will cause Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life. I will bring disaster upon them, my fierce anger, says the Lord, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. In this prophecy, Jeremiah predicts that Iran will be struck at the foremost place of its might, which today could infer an attack upon its nuclear program. One of Iran's most strategic and vulnerable nuclear targets is Bashar nuclear reactor located in the heart of ancient Elam. Jeremiah says that Iran has fiercely angered the Lord, and that provokes the Lord to cause a severe disaster inside of Iran. Israel seeks to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear nation. Perhaps this alludes to a nuclear disaster caused from a strike upon Iran's Boucher nuclear reactor. There's a prophecy written by Asaph the seer that many end time teachers believe has yet to find fulfillment. In this prophecy, a confederation of Muslim nations have taken crafty counsel against the Jewish people in Israel in order to destroy them as we read in Psalm 83, one through eight. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God, for behold, your enemies make a tumult, and those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against your people, and consulted together against your sheltered ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be remembered no more. For they have consulted together with one consent. They form a confederacy against you. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagrites, Gabal, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia with the inhabitants of Tyre, 
Assyria also has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Ezekiel 38, 1-9 The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him, and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I will bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed in full armor, a great host, all of them with buckler and shield, wielding swords. Persia, Cush, and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his hordes, Bethgarma from the uttermost parts of the north with all his hordes, many peoples are with you. Be ready and keep ready, you and all your hosts that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter years you will go against the land that is restored from war, the land whose people were gathered from many peoples upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. Its people were brought out from the peoples and now dwell securely, all of them. You will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your hordes, and many peoples with you. These are the modern day nations listed in Ezekiel 38 and 39 who will be mustered in the latter years to attack Israel, Russia, Iran, Turkey, Libya, Sudan, and Ethiopia. God tells us exactly what will happen to Iran, Russia, Turkey, and the many peoples with you when they attack Israel in Ezekiel 38, 18 through 23, and 39 to 7 and 8. And it will come to pass at the same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath I have spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him into judgment with pestilence and bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on the many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. And I will turn thee back, and leave but the sixth part of thee, and will cause thee to come up from the north parts, and will bring thee upon the mountains of Israel. So I will make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name any more. Then the nation shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. I've been informed by top-ranking military officials that Israel has been unable to launch even a single plane in defense. As I stand here, fighter planes are exploding in midair. They're crashing and falling to the ground without any explanation. And while no one can seem to give me any reason for why this is happening, I can tell you this. This all-out, unprecedented attempt to destroy Israel appears to be failing. God is the one who fights this battle for Israel. He does it for two reasons. To make his holy name known in the midst of his people Israel, that the nation shall know that he is the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Zechariah 2, 8, and 9. For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. For surely I will shake my hand against them, and they shall become spoil for their servants. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Israel is precious to Almighty God, the apple of his eye. He is simply saying, You touch my chosen nation Israel, you poke me in the eye. Is Vladimir Putin, the infamous Gog of Magog, that the prophet Ezekiel warned would come on the scene in the last days and lead a coalition of nations to destroy Israel? Or could Gog be Recep Tayyip Erdogan, another dictator, who is fast gaining power and dominance in the Middle East? Biblical scholars can't agree if the prophet Ezekiel was talking about a last day's assault on Israel being led by Russia or Turkey. Many popular Bible teachers claim that Gog will come from Russia, while others claim that Ezekiel's prophecy actually points to Turkey. Whether Gog is from Russia or Turkey, both nations are presently being led by undisputed dictators who could each very easily fit the Gog profile. Daniel 9, 26 and 27 and after the sixty-two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with the flood, until the end of the war desolations are determined. 
Then he, the Antichrist, shall confirm a covenant with many, who is Israel, the Palestinians, and possibly other Muslim nations, for one week, which is seven years. But in the middle of the week, three and a half years, he, the Antichrist, shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering, and on the wings of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. In Bible prophecy, we are told in Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the prince who is to come, who is the Antichrist, will come on the world scene and strongly confirm a seven-year covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies. This covenant will kick off the seven-year tribulation. Are we seeing any signs of a covenant of peace in the Middle East between Israel and her enemies today? Ceasefire negotiations are expected to resume Sunday in Qatar. CIA Chief William Burns will be joined by his counterparts from Israel and Egypt there. Meanwhile, the fighting goes on in and around Israel with tragic consequences. Horror in Gaza. Israel hitting Hamas targets, leaving buildings destroyed and, according to Palestinian officials, 38 dead, including women and children. The main hospital in northern Gaza cut off and out of commission following another Israeli raid on Hamas. As you see here, this is total destruction. In southern Lebanon, Israel's fight against Hezbollah gets tougher. Five reservists, just some of the Israeli soldiers killed today. Three journalists in Lebanon also killed by an Israeli airstrike. They work for Hezbollah and Iran-leaning media. Lebanon blasted Israeli strikes on civilians. This is a war crime based on a collective responsibility to protect. Hezbollah rockets continue to rain down on Haifa and northern Israel, most intercepted, but one got through, killing two, injuring seven. The Secretary of State Blinken wraps up his trip in London with with meetings with Arab leaders, readying talks for Sunday to try again to reach some kind of ceasefire with Hamas, and at least the partial release of the 101 hostages still held. We are intensely engaged, uh, and we are working hard to move this forward and get to that diplomatic resolution. We see the prophesied Antichrist right onto the world stage in Revelation 6-2, immediately following the rider of the white horse beginning his conquest of the world. We see peace will be taken from the earth when the rider of the red horse of war begins his ride across the earth as we read in Revelation 6, 3 and 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see, another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another, and there was given to him a great sword. Those who are here to see this will be as those who lived in the days of Noah. All will be well and life will be moving forward as normal when suddenly a flood of God's judgment will begin to fall on mankind which will last for seven years, the culmination of which will be the visible, physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to the earth at Armageddon. So as we look at what prophecy predicts is going to occur, potentially in the not too distant future, the world is someday going to rejoice that peace has finally come to the Middle East. What will follow that, however, will be anything but peace as the world is suddenly going to explode into warfare. Think if they listened to Biden, they'd be waiting for a bomb to drop on their head right now. He's been wrong about so much. I guess you'd have to say that she's been wrong, too, because, you know, they she always said they made the decision together. Israel didn't follow his advice. And I think it was a very, uh, you know, there it's a very the Middle East is rapidly changing. You know, there are prophets to say the world will come to an end in the Middle East, you know that, right? When you look at the weapons we have today, the biggest threat we have in the world today is nuclear weapons. Let's say you win in November. What do you do differently and how do you change this course that it seems we are on for World War III? How do you get us out of Ukraine? How do you stop what's going on in the Middle East? How do you put a stop to this? Right now, uh, you would get both of them. I know both very well. And, and again, I, I cannot, I do not want to tell you, you know, for the purpose of looking smart to five people that, you know, that say, oh, he was great. Because if I told you exactly what I do, I could, I, I could never make the deal. All I can tell you is that I would meet with Putin and I would meet with him. And I know exactly what I'd say to each one of them. And I believe that as president-elect, I would get that war stopped and stopped fast. All it takes is one person to launch a nuke and the world changes forever. And I've never felt like that was a possibility in my lifetime until now. Nearly 2,000 years ago, the Apostle John was banished to the island of Patmos as punishment for sharing his faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord gave John a series of visions which described things that would take place in the last days. The visions John saw were recorded and are now known as the Book of Revelation. Throughout the scriptures, Terrible times are forecast 
to the end of this present age. The prophet Isaiah describes the earth as empty and wasted. Isaiah 24.1 Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. In the book of Revelation, we read of an hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Revelation 3.10 Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. The Lord Jesus warns us of great tribulation which shall threaten the survival of all life on earth. Matthew 24, 21 and 22 For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. The Apostle Paul speaks of sudden destruction that shall come just when men are saying, Peace and safety. 1 Thessalonians 5.3 For when they say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. As these verses indicate, along with current events, make it plain that world conditions will be characterized by chaos, destruction, and death just before our Lord returns to take control of planet Earth. In the book of Revelation, we read about the poisoning of the oceans, the burning up of the grass and the trees, and the sun scorching people with great heat. The book of Revelation also tells us that horrible plagues will afflict mankind. There will be widespread wars and famines, and that the atmosphere will become so polluted as to reduce visibility by one-third. In the midst of all this devastation, the earth's population will flee to the caves as people cry to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. What could possibly bring about such universal carnage on the earth? Is the Bible describing a nuclear holocaust? Nuclear weapons appear to be specified in Zechariah 14.12. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets. And their tongues shall dissolve in their mouths. The book of Joel gives us detailed imagery that describes something so huge that it seems to encompass the earth and the sky. It is made up of fire and pillars of smoke and is so vast that it darkens the sun and reddens the moon. Joel 2, 30 and 31 And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood, before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. When is the rapture going to happen in relation to the tribulation? The timing of the rapture in relation to the tribulation is one of the most controversial issues in the church today. There are four views on the timing of the rapture. The pre-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs before the tribulation starts. The pre-wrath view, where the rapture happens before the great day of wrath, in Revelation 6:17, the mid-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at or near the midpoint of the tribulation, and the post-tribulation view, where the rapture occurs at the end of the tribulation. The primary scripture passage on the rapture is in 1 Thessalonians 4:13 through 18. It states that all living believers, along with all believers who have died, will meet the Lord Jesus in the air and will be with Him forever. 1 Thessalonians 4:13 through 18. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, 
and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. A few verses later, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, Paul says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord, Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation, which deals primarily with the time period of the tribulation, is a prophetic message of how God will pour out his wrath upon an unbelieving and unrepentant world. It seems inconsistent for God to promise believers that they will not suffer wrath and then leave them on the earth to suffer through his anger during the tribulation. Another passage on the timing of the rapture is in Revelation 3.10. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. Christ promises to deliver believers from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole earth. This could mean two things. Either Christ will protect believers in the midst of the trials, or he will deliver believers out of the trials. It is important to recognize what believers are promised to be kept from. It is not just the trial, but the hour of trial. Christ is promising to keep believers from a specific time period that contains the trials, namely the tribulation. The purpose of the tribulation, the purpose of the rapture, the meaning of 1 Thessalonians 5.9, and the interpretation of Revelation 3.10 all give clear support to the pre-tribulation position. If the Bible is interpreted literally and consistently, the pre-tribulation position is the most biblically based interpretation. Another good reason for a pre-tribulation rapture is the tribulation is called the time of Jacob's trouble as we read in Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. The tribulation is primarily for the salvation of the Jewish nation of Israel, as God renames Jacob Israel, as we read in Genesis thirty-two twenty-eight. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men, and have prevailed. After the rapture, the age of grace has ended, and God shifts his focus back to the Jews, as he promised to save a remnant of them, as we read in Zechariah thirteen eight and 9. And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire, will refine them as silver is refined, and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name, and I will answer them. I will say, This is my people, and each one will say, The Lord is my God. The coming seven-year tribulation is for the salvation of the Jewish nation in which the Jewish people will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. They will receive Yeshua as their Messiah, and they will cry out, Baruch haba b'shem adnei, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Whatever we believe about the timing of the rapture, there are two realities all Christians must keep in mind. First, no difference of opinion among Christians justifies unkindness or hostility toward those who hold different views. Jesus commands us to love one another, just as he loved us. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. John fifteen twelve. Jesus also said that by our love for one another, all people would know that we are his disciples, as we read in John thirteen thirty four and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Wrangling and name-calling over issues such as the timing of the rapture does not exhibit Christ's love. 1 Timothy 6, 3-5 If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such, withdraw yourself. Hebrews 10, 23-25 Let us hold fast, the confession of our hope without wavering. 
For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another, in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Brothers and sisters, no matter what our view may be on the timing of the rapture, we must exhort one another as we see the day of the Lord approaching. Don't be left behind. Accept Jesus today. When the rapture occurs, the world will capture the moment. Cell phones, security cameras, law enforcement body cams, doorbell cams, and more will all bear video record of the great disappearance. The world will reel with concern from watching the strange, mind-boggling and unbelievable video footage that goes viral across the globe. People vanish before their eyes and all caught on camera. This event won't be science fiction, conspiracy theory, or mindless speculation. When Christ comes for his people, it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Between the resurrected dead and the raptured, billions of people will exit this planet in an instant, but billions will be left behind. It will be chaos on our globe, but incredible glorious joy in the skies. This is the rapture, the great disappearance. It is vital to know what the Bible says about this coming day. The next event on God's prophetic agenda for the earth. Are you ready? The signs of Jesus' soon return are so strong now, and the evidence is so clear that any person willing to accept the truth can see that the end of the world as we know it is near. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For all have sinned, and fall short of the glory of God. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These are the ABCs of salvation. A. Admit that you're a sinner. B. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and God raised him from the dead. C. Call upon the name of the Lord, and you will be saved. Jesus paid the price for mankind's sin. He has provided a way to spend eternity with him and the Father. All you have to do is believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. God has already done all the work. All you must do is receive, in faith, the salvation God offers. Fully trust in Jesus alone as the payment for your sins. Believe in him, and you will not perish. God is offering you salvation as a gift. All you have to do is accept it. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That being said, we must repent of our sins. While repentance is not a work that earns salvation, repentance unto salvation does result in works. It is impossible to truly and fully change your mind without that causing a change in action. In the Bible, repentance results in a change in behavior. Repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. One day, Jesus is coming. You may be at church. You may be at work. You may be asleep. God grant that you will be ready when he makes his personal appearance. is short. Call upon the name of Jesus today.